Thank you. Well, the first randomized control trial was performed in 1948. It was by Austin Bradford Hill, a very famous st statistician. It was about streptomycin, by the way. Now, it's the gold standard to investigate the effect of an intervention. As we already discussed, randomized means to have an equal chance of being allocated to treatment group, and controlled means that there's new interventions compared to standard treatment, or if there's no, if there's no standard treatment to placebo. I would like to discuss the following objectives, the control group, randomization, blinding, some variations, variations in trial design and study reporting. The control group must be comparable to the intervention group in all relevant aspects, except for the treatment of interest, of course. Comparable means being similar on average, for example, for age, gender distribution. Otherwise, we have a bias in the comparison. And it allows to draw conclusions about the causal relationship between treatment and outcomes. So here, this is the only study design where we can really uh, draw the conclusion that the intervention really, for example, reduces a cardiovascular endpoint. The new intervention is compared to standard treatment when the treatment is already in use, or to placebo when there's no standard treatment. We have to think if it's ethically to compare the treatment as I already said in the morning, equivoise is required and means that there is uncertainty about the benefit of one treatment compared to the other treatment. Sometimes this is not so easy to define. For example, in the hybrid study, which I think was published in 2008, so not so long ago, there was the question, is there evidence for blood pressure lowering therapy in patients over 80 years? And they decided, no, there's no evidence that we should lower blood pressure in patients above 80 years of age. So the comparison group got placebo and nothing else, and it was highly successful, the study. A second difficult decision was the reverse of this study. It was about antagonization of Dabigatran with a specific antibody called idorosizumab in emergency situations. So the question was, what should we do with the control group? Should we give them placebo? Should we give them coagulation factor concentrates? And the final decision was to, to not to have any control group, which I still think is a pity because the evidence is not so strong from the study without any control group because we do not know about the influence on, on the clinical outcome now. About randomization, randomization means random allocation of participants to treatment arm. It's like tossing a coin. Usually you use a computerized random number generator and each participant has a known chance, usually 50%, but could be also a different percentage of being allocated to a treatment group. If you use equal group size, which is usually the case, then you maximize your statistical power. So usually you use 50% uh, distribution. And neither the investigator nor the participant can influence or predict, predict the allocation. So of course, uh, randomization needs to be done properly and not be influenced in any way, particularly not by an investigator. So no open envelopes or something like this. Um, the advantage of, of randomization, if you have correct randomization, it ensures comparability of treatment groups, it avoids allocation bias, and groups will be similar in all aspects except for the treatment. So it controls, as we discussed in the morning, for known and unknown confounders. The different methods of randomization. Simple randomization will result in relevant imbalances in small studies with regard, for example, baseline characteristics or the number of participants assigned to a treatment may be different. So simple randomization, if you study with 1,000 people, it's fine, but if you have like only 200, you have to be careful about simple randomization. And the way to solve this to do it is to do a specific method of randomization, for example, block randomization. This ensures that there's an equal distribution uh, within each block of patients. I will shortly show you how this works. And stratified randomization, as we discussed today in the morning, ensures equal distribution in relevant patient subgroups. So for example, in different centers, I make sure that they always also have in each center a balanced randomization. So 
So here we have an example of block randomization. Here in this case, we have blocks of four patients. In each block, we have equal distribution of the treatment arms. So for example, here 2A to B, and we see it's always 2A to B in different order. And what you actually randomize is these numbers. So you choose a number between one, uh, between one and six, and then you take the next block. But you can be sure after each block, you have the equal number of interventions. And this you can also combine with uh, randomization, for example, at different centers. So you're sure that at each center, they have the same number. Stratified randomization means the randomization occurs separately in relevant strata, for example, in age below or above 75 years of age. And it's important because um, the blocking or use blocks in this randomization because usually the groups are small within the strata. So it's good to combine stratified randomization with block randomization. And the stratified randomization prevents imbalances in relevant subgroups. And block randomization, as I said, is possible in strata. So here we see an example. This is the best trial published in New England 2015, and eligible patients were randomly assigned in a one-to-one uh, -one ratio with the use of a web response system, a system to undergo PCI with the use of Iberolimus stands or to undergo cabbage. And randomization was computer generated, was performed in random block sizes of six and eight, with stratification according to the participating center. So they combined block randomization and stratified randomization to be sure that in each center there were the same number of patients getting stents or cabbage. Because they were afraid that in one center they may be very good interventional cardiologists and do very good stents and now on they may be bad. So if you do not distribute patients equally, then you may influence the results. Let's go to blinding. Blinding means masking the identity of the treatment, the different ways of blinding. Simple, single blinded usually refers to um, surgical intervention. Usually only the patient is blinded. Double blinded means neither the investigator nor the participant are aware of the allocated treatment. For example, this is typical for pharmacotherapy. And triple blinding means additionally the endpoint evaluation committee is also blinded. To blind, we need a placebo if we use uh, pharmacotherapy uh, intervention. This can be a dummy remedy, a pill with same size and color, or even a double dummy. In case of comparison of two interventions with different aspects, each patient receives a true intervention and an indis indistinguishable dummy for the other treatment. So actually, there are two uh, placebos. But each patient gets one placebo always. And a third way, and I think a very important thing, and there's a lot of discussion about this, is sham operations. So also in intervention, surgical intervention, you have to think if you need sham operation because you may have a strong uh, placebo effect. The advantages of blinding is it avoids the placebo effect, so the response to medical intervention results from the intervention itself, not from the specific mechanism of action of the intervention. Masking of the participant avoids reporting bias. So based on the beliefs about the treatment, the participant may report events differently, unconsciously, and also not by purpose. And the same is true for the researcher. Based on his beliefs, he may uh, receive events or perceive events differently. And one more point, blinding also avoids compensatory treatment if one of the treatment arms is perceived to be weaker. So for example, if you knew anticoagulation and you think maybe this new anticoagulation is not as strong as the standard anticoagulation you made aspirin for example or something like this. So this would be compensatory treatment. If you do not know the groups you cannot do any compensatory treatment. And this is an example. The Simplicity Hypertension 3 study about blinding they told Prior unblinded studies have suggested that catheter-based renal artery denervation reduces blood pressure in patients with resistant hypertension. And now, Simplicity Hypertension 3, three study, they designed a prospective single blind, it was an intervention, uh, single blind randomized sham control trial. So the patient didn't know what uh, intervention he or she gets. 
patient with severe, severe resist, resistant hypertension randomly assigned in a two to one ratio to undergo renal denervation or sham procedure. So to reduce the number of patients getting on the sham procedure, they decided to do a two to one ratio. And here we see the surprising results. We see a significant decrease of the blood pressure in both groups. So in the denervation group, a reduction a significant reduction, but also in the sham group, so there was a strong placebo effect. And another, th but when you look at the difference in changes, there was no significant difference. The P was 0 0.8, so no significant change between, difference between the groups. Another important thing of the study is that they used here now ambulatory 24 blood pressure uh, as readout. And as we discussed in the morning, the redose is very important for biologic measurements, and it's much more objective than one office measurement of blood pressure. Another specific design is the probe design. Probe means prospective, randomized, but open label, and only blinded endpoint evaluation. So the probe design is used when double blinding is very difficult or too complex. For example, if you have a laboratory guided treatment like anticoagulation, if you have characteristic side effects, so you know by the side effects what the patient gets, which treatment the patient gets, or in ca uh, case of device studies. And the probe design may be good if you to avoid a very or too complex study procedure which may increase the likelihood of selecting particularly compliant patients and study discontinuation of participants. There was a lot of discussion in anticoagulation studies with NOACs because the first one, the real -life trial, used this probe design. And the further studies like the um, Rocket F study and Aristotle and then sure didn't use a probe design but did a double dummy study. But this very complex study uh, because you need, for example, sham INR measurements which makes the study very complex. So here we have the example for the realized study. The laboratory guided treatment of vitamin K antagonists, including sham INR measurements, requires a very complex blinding. A blinded study design may have led to frequent and uncontrolled unblinding when measuring global coagulation tests. So as soon as you measure global coagulation, you may know what the patient, in which group the patient is. And to minimize a potential investigator bias in the assessment of events, several safeguards have been used in the realized study, like outcomes were objective, clearly defined, and clinically relevant. Outcome events were adjudicated by blinded adjudication committee, and the dose of Dabigatran was blinded. But still, the problem could be, if they do not know about an event, they cannot, of course, uh, make any judgment about the event. So let me summarize advantages and disadvantages of rope design. Advantages, it's more economic, it's less complex, and therefore more similar to clinical routine, and we have a lower dropout rate. And the disadvantages, there's a differential probability of reporting events or reporting bias, and a blinded endpoint committee can only evaluate endpoints which have been reported. About variations in trial design, the usual trial design is a parallel group design, so the group A gets the blue treatment, the group B gets the red treatment. We can also do a crossover design, which means that the group A starts with red and then get blue treatment, and group B starts with blue and then gets red treatment. What is usually important is that we have a washout period in between. What is the advantage? We need a smaller sample size as there is no between subject variability. So because each subject is his own control, we need less sample size. But there are disadvantages. Of course, we cannot use it for acute treatment because you can only do it once and not the second time. It's only for temporary treatment, so in, like putting in a stand, you cannot do a washout, of course. The question is, is the washout period reliable so it's long enough or you have a leftover effect of the first treatment? And patients completely lost, are completely lost if the dropout occurs before second treatment period. So you can only count patients which really went through all the study procedure. And here we have a very nice example, the BAFE 2 study, which was actually presented in 2015. And they had only 314 patients with resistant hypertension. 
and they had to undergo four cycles of treatment with different uh, antihypertensives and one placebo arm, and they had 12 weeks for each treatment. They didn't have any washout period because they said, we measured the blood pressure after 12 weeks and we assumed that the last therapy does not work anymore after 12 weeks. And we see they have a dropout of 70, of 27%, so they can only analyze 73% of patients, but still a rather low number and they got a really nice and uh, results and significant results. Factorial design is another variation that allows testing more than one hypothesis in one study increases the efficiency of research, usually a two by two factorial design nowadays very often used if you want uh, a pharmaceutical industry wants to test a new pharmacotherapy and we have some, for example, academy initiated additional question, we can combine these two questions. So this is a rather clever study design. If you do randomization, you need four groups with all variations of the two treatments you are interested in. So you have one group where you have treatment B, one group with no treatment, one group with both treatments, and one group with treatment A. Here we have an example. That's the Infuse MI study, which assessed either the effect of an uh, thrombus aspiration catheter, export catheter, and uh, about abseximab, so a GP2B3 inhibitor. The important thing is that you always need to analyze that there's no significant interaction between your treat two treatments, which could be the case, that it's particularly good if you do uh, aspiration and use uh, and GP2B3 inhibitor, but that there was no interaction between the two uh, treatments in the study. So you always have to check. Another very good example is the Augusta study, which is now running, and we had studies about triple therapy now with NOACs and skipping aspirin, and so far the studies mixed the two questions. This will be the only study really separating the two questions. So in this study we can really answer, is there an advantage to use a Pixaban compared to VKA? And the second question, is it beneficial to skip aspirin and only use two therapies, which means weak, uh, anticoagulation, one platelet inhibitor? So this is a rather clever study design. Let me summarize the advantages of the factorial design. You need a smaller sample size than two separate trials. It can assess interaction modification of the effect of one treatment by the other treatment. This is also interesting for Augustus. Maybe there is some interaction between the two treatment variations. The disadvantage, you have added complexity in this one study. and The chance of adverse effects, of course, increases with two new drugs. Finally, shortly about study reporting, we also heard from Gianlucci about the standards for randomized controlled trials is the CONSORT statement, we have the strobe, STROBE statement for observational trials, and gives the gold standard how to report your clinical study. You know probably the study flow, this comes from the CONSORT statement where you're really required how to show your study flow and really to show what happens with your patient, where you have lost your patient, what is the final number of patients? So this is standardized and you should really report the study flow and you cannot read it, I cannot read it either. Um, but there are many more points how to, as all the points we discussed today should be in the paper and they give you really good advice what is the standard of reporting and you should follow these instructions. In the sake of time, I think I'm almost finished. Um, let me summarize the advantages of a randomized control. It's randomization, it avoids selection bias, it controls for known and unknown confounders, so that's the only study design controlling for unknown confounders. Double blinding avoids reporting bias and observation bias, so we really can handle our two enemies, which is bias and confounding. The analysis of a randomized controlled trials gives strong evidence of causal relationship and multiple outcomes can be examined. We didn't discuss this, but of course we can have several endpoints and outcomes. There are also disadvantages of randomized controlled trials. John Lucci already alluded on this. It's expensive and requires a large study team, data restricted for several years, and the external validity may be limited by volunteer buyers. So we see a strong effect in patients who want to participate in randomized controlled trials with restriction to geographical areas. 
We have a complex study examination not used always in routine. We have a selection of composite endpoints not used in clinical practice sometimes, so we have to be very careful what composite endpoint has been chosen, and there may be incomplete reporting for adverse events. And we need always to ask when we design a randomized control, is it ethical to randomize, so is the equivalent hours of treatment? We are not allowed to withhold a beneficial treatment or allocate a harmful treatment. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>